at Momentum, we know that success breeds success. So we are proud to help build the momentum of every woman's journey to success. We call it Momentum. Because the momentum you generate is formidable. And when we join forces, our momentum is unstoppable. Momentum, here for every woman's journey to success. Welcome back to She Owns Her Success. My name is Nozi Poshabalala. We have had an incredible couple of weeks. As we make our way into week four, we are continuing to unpack the success stories of incredible women with the view that when they share their stories, it becomes normal for other women to also share their stories of success. I'm looking forward to the conversation and introducing you to my stellar panel. You know, on the one hand, you say be conscious of the humility such that it doesn't become something that holds you back. But it doesn't mean that we're saying you must be arrogant. We're not, it, we're not saying that you're being aggressive. But what happens when that's what you're labeled as, Tato? Because you are, here's this female farmer, right? In a space where she doesn't belong um, in the first place, according to other people, um, running a business that she has, she, she isn't quite capable of running because men just know how to do this better. And then you vocalize yourself and then you let go of the humility and you own your success and you articulate what you want and what you don't want. And the label comes. She's bossy. She's arrogant. She's aggressive. She's, she's reaching beyond beyond her role. She needs to stay in her lane. <laughs> What's your reaction to that? What do you say when that happens? Well, I've had many encounters where, I, let's say I get to an auction and I'm bringing in animals and, you know, they will look at you like, who are you? Confidently getting off a truck, confidently taking big bulls out, bringing them out. And I think... That's all you just need is confidence. Mm. I've been called bossy even from a young age. And it's just because I think I knew in our own household, I had responsibilities. I was a valued member of my family. Mm. And our parents treated us equal. We had equal responsibilities, chores. So I knew that I have a way I can think of things. I have value. I can contribute. And I need to articulate that or I'll fall into the background. Mm. So I had uh, three other siblings. So in order to get the attention to stand out, you need to, you know, come out and say what you want, what you need. And I've had very uh, lots of battles around that because there's been spaces where you interact and, you know, um, I have male workers and they don't even answer to their wives, but they have oh. to answer to me. <laughs> so, you know, now you have to speak to people um, that are used to the rural space um, and now you have to tell them about gender sensitivity yeah. you have to tell them when you say this it's wrong now you you know so it's it's really a learning curve you know yeah. so I think once you're confident and you can show that you're not phased by what people say what you do it's all about the hustle at the end of the day sure. can you deliver you know and if I have something to deliver I'm going to bring it I'm going to put my A carry it on I'm going to prove that I can do it but I can do it even better and that's how how you grow yeah. your brand as an individual and your business is to be saying I can prove I've got a concept I'm, I have value and that's what I'm going to bring forward I, I'm going to stay on labels just a while longer Fran I, how many times were you perhaps told that you're trying to play in a man's space and that actually this is not where you belong I, were you ever labeled in ways that have not been helpful for you and how did you break out of that bossy arrogant overstepping your your place not knowing your place um and all of those things yes uh, for sure i think that was always what i was told is this is not your area what are you doing here but i think women have to also learn how to negotiate um through the pitfalls and find their own paths to overcome hardships mm -hmm. and i think many women have learned to do that and uh for me also, I think when we see success, when women achieve success, other women must support the women yes. who have achieved success because men always support each other. But it's a common trait that women often, when they see success, pull each other down. And that's one aspect mm. where we have to come together and, and acknowledge and support success and spread it around to yeah. other women. Sure. So amplifying, 
um, each other's success. So when we see you going up for the third time in a row <laughs> this time uh, to go get that Raging Bull Award, we're all going to be uh, making a loud noise from where we are to say, look at this woman um, achieving amazing things. So I'm going to transition with you, Sanisha, to a different um, focus of this conversation. Over the years, we have seen women become increasingly financially independent as well. Um, we're seeing women running businesses. We're seeing women become millionaires. We're seeing, um, you know, women on the cover of Forbes as a billionaire, you know. And I want to just build on this idea of shrinkage that Kotato also raised because one would imagine that when we don't own even our own financial success, we try to downplay it um, because we're too afraid that if I come across that I, I've, 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 I've been too successful financially, it's intimidating, it's unladylike. It's not, it's not a natural thing for a woman to achieve. What have you observed? Are you seeing women becoming more financially independent? And how are we dealing with that? Definitely. So we have seen more and more women becoming financially independent, financially literate. And that really stems from education. So we now have more females than males that graduate, particularly yes. with postgraduate degrees. And from there comes financial literacy and an ability to take care of your own finances. And even in spaces where you may not be more financially literate, being open enough to know that you need to have sound financial advice for someone to help you with your own finances, yeah. making sure that you have enough savings, making sure that you can be solid throughout your retirement. And I think that's quite an important aspect for women going forward. Uh, mm -hmm. We also know that women tend to outlive men. So it's even more important, <laughs> together with the pay gap, that women yes. um, do have access to financial literature to make sure that they are stable on their finances for a longer period of time. Um, unfortunately, I do think that there is a bit of a cultural aspect to mm. this as well. Mm. Um, as you say, you know, trying to take ownership of being um, financially successful may not go down well in all types of cultures yes. and can be maybe intimidating and you feel like you may not be a success in other aspects of your life. And this is where I think, you know, culturally those norms need to also be broken sure. down and re-looked really at um, in order to support women throughout various cultures in society. Mm -hmm. So, I'm, I mean, I, I love that particular insight. So before I lose this point that you've raised, let's talk about pay gap, right? Because um, I'm aware that actually there's, uh, there's an incredible... Um, a global event that's going to be taking place in September in Geneva, which is it's called Epic, and it's just all it's all about how do we close this thing once and for all because the gender pay gap is still there. Mm. What has your experience been about fighting for women to get paid the same as men for the same job or the same sporting code? Um, is this something that you found that is still very far uh, to achieve for women? At least when it comes to football, certainly. Yeah. I mean, and that's worldwide. That's yeah. not in South Africa. But I think a lot of it boils down to uh, media, sponsorship, advertising, all those areas. And Why are we not putting money behind women? Well, I think um, they don't bring in the the, the crowds. You know, mm -hmm. at a big stadium, you can have FNB packed out on a Saturday, 100,000 people watching Chiefs versus Pirates, but yeah. you're not going to get that for two women's teams playing. And that's where we have to change the, the thinking, the, the mindset. Yeah. And that's why now with many of our women footballers playing overseas, professional football, they're okay. getting more recognition, they're getting more money, yeah. they're getting yeah. more uh, sponsors. So it's a gradual yeah. process. But certainly, I think it was mentioned earlier, the 50-50 thing, we have legislation, it's in all the bodies, sports bodies, whatever, needs to be implemented far more forcefully yeah. to ensure that women have equal rights. Mm. Not They shouldn't have to be fighting about this. It must, it's there. It yeah. must just happen. How um, do we do that, though, Tato? Break those cultural stereotypes. Anisha, Fran, raising essentially the same thing to say it starts... It starts much deeper than at the point where the payroll uh, variable comes in because the only reason that we're not filling out stadiums is because there's probably a belief that a football game played by women is not going to be as good as a football game played by men. How do we undo all that we've learned over the years? 
I think we were actually having a conversation about this earlier to say we need to be having conversations with the private sector, the people that have the money to drive this thing and tell them, you know, that that we want to have more women on TV. We want to see more equal representation. And even when we break it down to society, that we need to be having these conversations and at ground levels, at the lochotlas, at the churches, yes. you know, with the chiefs, you know, actually try and have those conversations and then put a value to a woman, her time, yeah. you know, her value within society. So we've just based it on an economic standpoint to say, if you can come and you can pitch to work, you do your thing, we'll pay you. But actually we should, extrapolate that out to say that yes there's that work aspect there's, there's also that social aspect to say and I think that's what uh, the conversation is turning into yeah. even around um, unpaid labor how much work do we do physically as women yeah. and we don't get paid for it in a way to say that you know we've put so much time into building our, our society or building our homes or right. creating we support our mothers our grandmothers our aunts our sisters kids it's so natural for us us, We're you know? always the first sacrifice when exactly. somebody needs to stay yeah. home as well, Ten right? Years. Someone is sick. Who looks after those mm. women? Who are the frontline workers who are, even in this COVID times, yes. we see nurses. Yeah. It's women who are going to work uh, do, and they're humble about it and they're doing the work. So I think as a society, we need to understand what is the economic and social value of a woman. And once we understand that, because that was defined back then, that's yes. why men went to work. Yeah. There was that value. A man needs to work. It's the industrial age. Yes. It's physical. Now we, we transition to technological age. We're in yeah. five IR. Yes. You know, there's a lot of things. We're having Zoom meetings. We, you know, so this should start translating and seeing how does the system can now sure. work to benefit women and their lifestyle so we can pick up kids or we can be more involved in church mm -hmm. in the you know so we 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 need to have, be having those type of conversations and you mentioned something very interesting to saying the boy the conversation of the boy child yeah. you know we need to promote that because yeah. without having those conversations with the boy child they were not going to value the girl child yes so the past decade, you know, I grew up in a society where they say you need to work, you know, with women empowerment, all of that. And then the boys are left behind and you have very mature girls. And then the boys are just like, you know, and then we grow up, we have expectations. You know, if we yeah. want to grow up in life, we have expectations of men. You know, and but we we we're not having similar conversations with them. We really know what we expect of women, so we need to bridge that gap of communication. So I'm going to tell you a quick story before we start wrapping up. Quick story based on what you've said. So um, I was on stage at the at the International Labour Organization uh, in Geneva, and the conversation was about the care economy. Exactly what you described, the work that women do that nobody even values, right? So the raising the family, staying home so my executive husband uh, can make it um, uh, further in his career and so on. And the question came up w from the audience, which was, what would it take for us to begin paying those who are in the care economy? And a man stood up and the man said, if men were the caregivers, you best believe you'd be paying us for it because we would demand it. And so I think there's, there's an incredible thing here also about, which Fran also raised, which is sometimes the invitation to come shatter the barrier will not be there. And so we've actually got to do the work of actually stepping in and saying, actually, there's, there's an economic value to the role that I'm playing as your wife, as your mother, as the caregiver, as the family caretaker that nobody is valuing. And I think you raised such a beautiful point um, about revisiting the, the economic value of women. Because for the longest time, it's always been a fraction of what the man is. And so because of it being a fraction, it's always, we're always in the supportive role and things have changed. This is a knowledge-based economy. Mm -hmm. And to Sanisha's earlier point, um, women are as smart if not smarter than men these days. Anyway, okay, <laughs> so let me begin to um, come to the end of our conversation. She owns her success. I want to latch on to the word owns. If you could give a piece of advice to our listeners, to women broadly, to say, if there's one thing that you can do to better own your own success, here's the advice I'd like to leave you with. What would that be, Khotatsu? What would you leave with them? For me, I would always advise 
before anything else, always be yourself. It makes, it opens up the conversation, it makes it easier, it makes it more comfortable. You are unique. I'm not a Sanisha, there'll never be another Tato or Frank. So for me, we have our own unique way of doing mm, things. Yes. And that's what people are yearning for. That's what the world wants to see. So always bring out who you are and that defines your own success. That's mm. the only way you can own it because there could never be another you. Sure, so. that's, that's incredible because also I think what we didn't touch on in this conversation, but what I'm hearing in your response is don't get tricked into becoming a man uh, mm. but as a way of showcasing yeah. your success. You can own your success as a woman yes. and do it authentically, as you're saying, by just being yourself. Yeah. I love that. Sanisha, yeah. what are you leaving our listeners with? Now, I think if I draw on our conversation from today, something stood out for me, which is um, what KG mentioned earlier, that you never know who's watching you. So I think what's important leading with this conversation about success is Never stop being a learner, but also never stop being a teacher. Because I think sure. as women, we play two roles in society. And that is really to draw on the learnings that we have been given from people who've paved the way before us and to help make things easier for the people that we will leave our legacy with going forward. Mm. So never stop learning. I love that. But never stop mm. teaching. I'm going to come back to that point as, as our final wrap up. Um, let me come to you, Tato. What are you leaving our listeners with? one way to better own their own success? I think um, as women, we need to strive for independence and that, that independence will help us fulfill our dreams. You know, nothing should stop us from fulfilling our roles, seeing our dreams. You know, not even a pandemic should be able to stop <laughs> us from just keep on pushing, you know. Yeah. I think we should leave the excuses mm -hmm. and, you know, forget the pretext that we're going to be saved one day. Mm. We're here, yeah. we, are, we, we need to live our lives, we need to fight the battles. And if we can be independent and not be dependent on anyone else but ourselves, then yeah. we really own, you own your success sure. then. So I love that you're saying you're underscoring ownership as independence because when you're independent, you've got the ability to make decisions based on your own rational thinking, not because somebody's dictating it to you. You then really are um, able to start your own journey of success. So I really love that. So this idea of be mindful of who you're dependent on and what dependencies uh, you, you're getting yourself tied into that make owning your success very difficult. Fran, what would you leave our listeners with? Um, an important point for me, I think, is education. I mm. think the, the key to all success is education. And I've made that a priority in my mentoring of uh, coaches is to not just study books at school, but know your topic, know your area where you're operating. Be knowledgeable because knowledge is power. Mm. So education is a crucial aspect in the area you want to be involved in to make sure that you know as much as you possibly can because it gives you a firm foothold to get mm. into that world you want to. It gives you legitimacy. Yeah. Um, it gives you legitimacy. I mean, we were talking earlier about this idea of um, substance over form, that as women, our form is that we're women, white women, black women, mm. colored women, Indian women, but our substance is greater than our form. And this is what I'm hearing you say, is that the knowledge uh, that gives you that edge is the thing that gets you um, ahead. So as we begin to close, you touched on mentorship. I think um, the idea of sharing your story has become a, a theme that we have uh, um, grappled with. And what I'd love for us to do as a closing is to get each of you to share with me just in what ways are you creating opportunities to bring other women along? Because your story today, your story of success is inspirational. Many other women are going to look at themselves through the lens of you and um, be inspired to do more. But it doesn't take just moments like this. There are everyday opportunities uh, for us to touch, to influence somebody's life. So how are we sharing our own success stories every day? And how might we share them more um, each and every day? So I'm going to go this way, work my way out this way, and then we'll close. Um, for me, I mean, I'm always part of um, lots of charities, so it's always a huge part of my life. And like I mentioned earlier, we're part of Take a Girl to School. 
Um, so for me, that um, is a way of actually empowering those who are coming up. Like I said, the way you carry yourself, how you yeah. interact with them, when they come here and see the environment that you're, you're in, they're able to visualize it, they're able to see it, it's there, it's, yeah. you know, they've seen you do it. So for me, I love that charity because you're actually showing somebody that they can yeah. do it themselves. So, and these young kids are very impressionable, they come from hectic backgrounds, you know what I mean? So, um, to give them a different narrative, yeah, is so important. So that's why I'm like, never forget who is watching. Sure. Beautiful way to close. Thank you for sharing your story. Thank you for being deliberate about partnering with these organizations and just uh, be mindful about how you're showing up every day because you, as you rightfully say, um, you never know who's watching. Sanisha, how are you sharing your story? How are you making sure that your success becomes somebody else's success? Um, so again with KG, I think, you know, we shared that love of the initiative that was started to take a girl child to school and make sure that they stay in school. Um, and it's also about creating a space for them at the table and letting them even just see the table that it exists, you know. Yeah. Um, I think for young females out there, it's much more easier to identify being able to one day be in that space if you see a face that's similar to yours in that space. Yes. And it gives you some vision of the future. Um, in my own small area in the economic space, we are always open to having students, interns, scholars coming through to us to chat about the field of economics. What does it mean? What does it entail? What do you need? What kind of skill set do you need? What kind of you know education do you need in order to get into that field? What is the job about? Um, and I think that's so important because often, uh, and I'm sure you know it's quite similar for everyone here on the panel that when we were growing up, we didn't always have that opportunity yeah. to have that access. And now to be in a position to give it to someone else, I think, is really important. Mm. You know what they say, right? It's always very difficult to become something you've never seen. Mm. And so, I mean, I love that, 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 that analogy you're giving us about sight. And also just to see the table, mm. as you yeah. say, that it does exist because we don't always believe that. So that's an incredible takeaway. Let me come to you, Tato. Um, how are you sharing your story of success and how are you doing this for other women? Well, I think where I've been able to share my success is heeding the call. When, um, when I'm being asked to contribute to platforms, I go, I try, because I, I think there needs to be representation. There needs to be a woman face. There needs to be a young person there. There needs to be a woman of color. There needs to be someone there, you know. So when opportunities come and um, I, I, I try to fill that space, mm. I've been able to share my stories on various platforms from going to UN, going to FAO. You know, I've even been to China and just share what are my experiences as a farmer on the ground. And I think that's where we start to opening up as exposure you can only see as much as you can only do as much as you can see yeah. and once we start opening the horizon and sharing that even the most simplest thing from social media to replying to emails yeah. of people just asking you the most simple questions you know my LinkedIn will be full of questions <laughs> from people and I can't get through all of them yeah. but I try to just say I'm going to take out the time just to ask the ones that are asking the right questions yeah. let me share my insights sure. and I think as women we just need to take out that time and understand that that's how we can be revolutionaries it's not we don't need to take up arms and you know fight the system it's from within mm. you know helping each other bringing each other up sharing our success stories but actually sharing our mistakes and I think as women we we, we don't do that enough yeah. share the mistakes so somebody else doesn't have to go through it yeah, so painfully exactly. yeah. that it's easier they get so and that shortens the learning curve for them they can become successful much quicker than you were able to mm. and I think that's what we need to you know be drawing in down to the next generation to say you can achieve even more and above than I can um, and this is my story. I love that yeah. so sharing our successes but not being fearful mm -hmm. to share our mistakes as well because the benefit of short circuiting that journey for somebody else is just absolutely there so Fran you're taking us home uh, with your final <laughs> comment um, for me I think what for me is the most important thing is, is seeing my success that has been transferred to other women in administration, coaching, life, uh, that they are now being successful and influencing other women. So it's, that's what we need is this continual snowballing effect mm. 
that you forever seeing women being empowered and changing and being successful. So that for me is a dream come true is to get a call from somebody I coached long ago to say now I'm in this position. That's success for me and it's success for them in taking their rightful place in society. Sure, well, that's a beautiful place for us to close this conversation. Fran's words was, be uh, that snowball. I'm going to change that and say, be the momentum. Be the momentum that creates uh, pathways to success for other women. We've had an incredible conversation about she owns her success. We've lifted the stories of the women who have joined me on this podcast today to really understand their journeys, to understand the barriers that they've had to overcome in order to get to a place where they are comfortable about owning their success. But what we've also heard is how they are deliberately creating spaces for other women to hear these shared stories so that the momentum of shared success um, amongst women becomes the norm. My name is Nozi Shabalala, and it's been an absolute privilege to be the host of these conversations. What an incredible journey. We started off this journey with a view that we are going to surface the success stories of the diverse women with diverse successes over four weeks. And I think what we've done is that we've normalized success for women. What we've done is broken barriers. We've challenged stereotypes and we've certainly rewritten scripts. Thank you so much for making the time to join us. My name is Nozi Poshabalala. It's been a pleasure. <laughs>